Our gospel passage today is from the Gospel of John, and this is chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on, for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, what, was, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And Paul is going to be sharing the message with us today. Mask on. I know it's awkward. Just uh, yeah, take it out. You guys can hear me and stuff, right? I speak in the mic. Yeah. Speak in the mic. Okay. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. I'm very, thank you. Like this. Praise the <laughs> All right. Um, there's an appreciation in the Gospel of John for questions. There are a lot in the book, and there are a lot in this passage. In this passage, we find a crowd that just a few verses earlier was miraculously fed from a few loaves of fish. And then, from whom Jesus miraculously fled by walking on the water. They're asking Jesus a lot of questions. Rabbi, when did you come here? What must we do to perform the works of God? What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it, believe you? What work are you performing? <clears throat> There's also an older question. It's referenced in the scene, and in a way, the scene itself is framed by this older question. What is it? That's actually the question I ask. What is it? What is it is an English translation of manna. That is the, um, this is what the Israelites said not long after that first Passover when they encountered the fine flaky substance that God miraculously provided for them in the wilderness. What is it? Man. It was then their salvation from starvation. The memories of this grain from heaven were deeply ingrained into the poems and songs of the people, like the psalm reading for today, especially in their Passover liturgies. And the imagery was also projected, hopefully and prophetically, into the future when God would again miraculously provide in abundance. God's supernatural gift of bread also came to be associated with much more than physical nourishment with nourishment of the soul by the revelation of God. Recall Jesus' response when he was tempted in the wilderness. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
These memories and hopes and images are heavy in the air of this scene, which happens to take place near the time of the Passover festival. <clears throat> I'm fascinated by the echo of this old question, manna, or what is it, in today's gospel passage and in our lives today. I feel that it expresses with honesty, irony, maybe even a bit of humor, very natural human response to God's supernatural provision, a response that's relatable and is also telling about our inability to wrap our minds around God's provision for us. On the flip side, I find it profound that this question is also an answer in the sense that manna was God's answer to the Israelites' hunger in the wilderness, and ultimately in the sense that Jesus is the bread of God who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The interplay of this question, and more importantly, of this answer, is rich, both in Scripture and in our own lives. In today's Gospel reading, we find the crowd engaging in dialogue with Jesus, the bread of God who comes down from heaven and not knowing what this bread is or how to receive it, even though he had just miraculously multiplied the bread before their eyes. Jesus tells them that they missed the point, that they're after food that spoils in contrast to what is being offered, that is, food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. When they ask Jesus what work they must do to get this better bread, he tells them to believe in the one whom God has sent. Yet they still ask for a sign, ironically, giving Jesus the example of the manna that their ancestors ate in the wilderness. Jesus relocates them from that past event, the present, tells them that his father gives them the true bread from heaven that gives life to the world. Now the crowd asks directly for this bread, and Jesus tells them point blank, I am the bread of life. According to people who no things about the original grammar. The emphasis of the statement may read more like the bread of life. That's me. The crowd doesn't seem to understand that Jesus himself is claiming to be the bread of life. They're focused on natural, physical bread, not bread in the sense of God's word who sustains the universe. They also don't seem to understand that the work to get this bread is to simply believe him. The givenness of this true bread from heaven, like the givenness of the manna in the wilderness, is so striking and yet so incomprehensible for the crowd. A few verses before, right after Jesus had multiplied the loaves on the mountain, the crowd had wanted to make a king out of Jesus in their own fashion, and they followed him across the lake because they wanted him for the bread he gave, but not as the bread he is. They had seen him as a political or economic solution, not as the word of God himself made flesh. I find myself subject to the same tendencies and temptations as the crowd. And we see them at play on a larger scale in various Christian cultures and theologies. It's too easy to define the Messiah according to our own desires and expectations. It's too easy to latch on to an idea about God and miss the living God who gives himself. We build up and fortify our own systems of theology and can't even see through them to this living God. I'm struck by how different this is from the image of manna, of a bread literally descending from the heavens on a daily basis. And if you had tried to collect it and keep it, it's spoiled. It is given. He is given and must be received as given or not at all. There's no recipe for man. Why is it so hard to receive that? At least in part, I think because we're conditioned in this fallen world to cook things up for ourselves, not receive things as given. Maybe we're motivated by pride, fear, control. I don't know. It feels like some sort of fallen, evil gravity. I think it pulls on all of us, but perhaps some are more affected than others. Little kids come to mind as an interesting example. 
Lindsay was talking with Eden and Ezra about this gospel passage, and it tickles me that right away it reminded Ezra the stories of manna and water in the desert. That's what his mind went to. Then Eden, providing her commentary on the story, explained, yeah, God was like, zippity-doo, and the bread came down. <laughs> there feels like some innate form of acceptance there. <clears throat> and their interaction with the story makes me think of when Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Later on, he tells his disciples that unless they change and become like little children, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't think we have to over-glorify children. My own can be disturbingly selfish and aggressive and distinctly unreceptive. <laughs> and I won't pretend to know exactly what it is about little children that is to be so emulated, but they do seem, by nature, to be in a vulnerable position, a position that does not allow so easily for the delusion that they can live without continual sustenance from beyond themselves. Adults are typically more capable of living in that delusion. The church can help us be less delusional. In our continual, repeated practices and sacraments of praying, worshiping, remembering, studying, serving, and acting together, we confront our sins and our self-made idols of God and open ourselves to be confronted by the living God. And one practice in particular seems appropriate in light of today's passage, communion. As the verses continue in John, the conversation in fact, leads into the territory of communion, or the Eucharist. Leaving aside the theories and technicalities of what exactly communion is and isn't, it strikes me that the practice itself, however mundane, provides an opportunity to engage in the simplicity, the givenness, the physicality of the bread of life. In that moment, week after week, we're invited to marvel at the bread of God that comes down from heaven to give life to the world and to receive it. 